Good evening, everyone. My name is Aswa Patel, and I am the VP of Events at CIC Vancouver. It is my pleasure to welcome you to CIC Vancouver's second Foreign Policy by Canadians event. This event is based out of Vancouver, which is located on the traditional and unceded land of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Coast Salish people. A bit over a year ago, the CIC, was, with its 16 branches across Canada, set out its vision for a major initiative aimed at defining Canada's foreign policy goals in 2020. We are now proud to launch a major deliberative democracy initiative, along with our partners. Foreign Policy by Canadians aims to give a voice to Canadians from all backgrounds and walks of life and shaping Canada's position in a changing world. Through events such as this one, we aim to foster educated discussion on various issues that matter to Canadians in order to produce policy recommendations that hopefully deliver results. The main themes we have decided to discuss include global public health, human security, economic development, and climate change. This evening's discussion on women in the global economy promises to be very interesting. And I'd like to thank our speakers and moderators for joining us. It will run from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with questions from the audience coming in at 6.30. Feel free to send your questions to the Q&A button in order for Dr. McPhail um, to answer them on the Zoom chat. Our moderator is Dr. Fiona McPhail, a, a professor of economics at the University of Northern British Columbia. Her main research program centers on gender work and public policy. She has published journal articles with co-authors on gendered work in China and its connection with intra-household decision-making, mental health, and the left behind population. For the Asian Development Bank and other UN affiliates, she has prepared commissioned reports, including one on good practices to promote gender equality in the labor market and empirical analysis on gender equality and women economic empowerment in the countries such as Cambodia, China, Philippines, and Kazakhstan. Welcome panelists, and thank you, Dr. McPhail, for moderating for us today. Okay, well, thank you very much and welcome everybody. Well, I'm delighted to moderate this evening's discussion among such distinguished members of the panel. And I extend my thanks to the CIC Vancouver organizers, particularly Saba Gos, Asma Patel, and Tatiana Parrish for inviting me and in organizing this um, webinar. So in today's conversation, the panelists have been asked by the CIC organizers to address the intersecting themes of women's participation in the global economy, the global commitments to 17 sustainable development goals, and actions Canada should take to enhance women's leadership. They've been asked to specifically consider the UN Women a 2018 report titled Turning Promises into Action, Gender Equality in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The organizers gave me this, the description of this event, and with this in mind, I'm going to suggest four broad questions, which I hope will help the panelists um, have a conversation about these important issues. But I'd like to start by introducing members of the distinguished panel. So we have uh, Nyla Valji, who is joining us, I think, from New York. So thank you very much for, for joining us at such a, a late hour. Uh, Nyla is the Senior Gender Advisor to the UN Secretary General. She heads the Secretariat for the United Nations European Union Spotlight Initiative to Eliminate Violence Against Women and Girls and supports the implementation of the Secretary General's Gender Parity Strategy. She joined the transition team of the Secretary General designate Guitaris in November 2016 and the Executive Office of the Secretary General in 2017. She has an extensive background in peace and security with, with UN women, um, as well as having worked in South Africa with the regional transitional justice work of the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation. And if all of that wasn't enough, she also has an academic background where she founded and managed the International Journal of Transitional Justice. And she's the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook on Gender and Conflict. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Barbara Orser. 
Dr. Orser is a full professor and the Deloitte Professor in Management of Growth Enterprises at the University of Ottawa. And I've just found out this evening that Dr. Orser is actually in BC at the moment in Terrace. Um, Dr. Orser's research, teaching and advocacy focus on entrepreneurship and women's economic empowerment. She has advisory roles uh, with Women 20, the acting head of, she's been the acting head of Delegation Canada, uh, UN Women Empowerment Advisory Group Canada. She's a board member of Women's Economic Imperative, and she's on the editorial board of the International Journal of Gender and Entrepreneurship. That's among many of, she has many other roles as well. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce Dr. Laura Parisi. Dr. Parisi is a political scientist trained in feminist international relations with expertise in international human rights, development, political economy and research methods. Dr. Parisi is a faculty member at the University of Victoria. She is the past section chair of the feminist theory and gender studies section of the international studies uh, section in 2014. And she has a current shirk sponsored research project uh, with community-based partners in Victoria, Uganda, Zambia, and Tanzania. And she focuses upon how women's human rights and development organizations are responding to changes in, in the international development aid landscape. So you can see from those bios that we have uh, a set of experts and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So to get the international development and also lie behind the report, which we're going to focus upon, I, I'm going to ask the panelists to, um, to start by giving us an overview of one or more key concepts. And these are gender equality, women's empowerment, and women's full and effective uh, leadership. At the same time, this is a bit of a tall order, but to also tell us something about how they've used these concepts in their own academic and professional lives so that we can get to know, get to know our panelists a little bit better. So with that um, as sort of a, a preamble then, I'd like to ask Nyla Valji to lead us off uh, and then perhaps because I'm just going to go in the order that I can see you on my screen. We'll move to Dr. Laura Parisi and then to Dr. Barbara Orser. So over to you, Nyla. Great, Fiona, thank you so much. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, uh, with all of you. And uh, thanks to the organizers, to CIC and to Asma uh, Patel for, for organizing this and the invitation to be here this evening. Um, you asked that we cover one of these one of these key concepts, and and I'm going to focus on the the last question, uh, women's participation and full and meaningful uh, participation and leadership. And the reason for that is because I think it's not just the answer to this question. I actually think it's the answer to so many of the pressing questions and challenges that we are facing globally at the moment. That includes the big questions of the climate crisis, inequality, conflict, and insecurity. And the reason for that is that when we have gender balanced leadership, when we have women in leadership positions and, and equal participation, it simply leads to better outcomes for everybody. When we have women in parliaments, we know that we have greater spending on social development. Uh, when we have uh, women in parliaments, we also are more likely to conclude climate agreements. When women are meaningfully involved in peace processes, we can actually quantify the impact. Um, uh, peace processes are 35% more likely to be sustainable in the medium's long term. When women are on the boards of private sector companies, um, the bottom line is not only better, but it's a triple bottom line, one that also focuses on inclusion, environmental uh, uh, impact. And we can name this kind of knock-on effect in every sector uh, uh, in society. In the past months, uh, since we've been dealing with the COVID-19 crisis, which I know we'll be speaking about a little bit later, but we've really seen for the first time an unprecedented focus on women's, uh, on women's leadership. We have seen articles by Forbes, CNN, uh, Harvard uh, Business Review, 
really looking at the effectiveness of women's leadership. We've seen that countries that are headed by women heads of state um, uh, have lower prevalence and in infection rates, are more on track for socioeconomic recovery. But it's not just about heads of state. We've seen it directors of, of, of health, heads of hospitals, mayors, governors, um, uh, et cetera. And this is not because women are naturally better, smarter, more peaceful. It's simply that diversity and inclusion leads to better outcomes for everybody. And I think, again, if we look at the current context of COVID-19, we've really seen the way in which our social, political, and economic systems, our model of thinking about these things, has been crafted through a particular lens. Um, and so what we call essential workers, what's kept us going these past months, um, are disproportionately women. Uh, and they are not the ones that we value in our economy. In fact, they are the lowest paid workers. Um, where we spend our money in our economy is not on essential work and what keeps societies going. It's rather on things like the military. And yet, if question how many women it is that die at the hands of, of partners and, uh, and families every day. So I think diversity switches and, and, and has us bring new uh, perspectives and, and through that uh, new outcomes. And yet, some 6% of countries are headed by women. We still conclude peace agreements with absolutely no women around the table. We still have a handful of women in, in the Fortune 500 uh, companies uh, uh, leading them. We have very few women in positions of leadership. And I think this is something that Canada has recognized with its gender parity cabinet under the current prime minister, a focus on a feminist foreign, uh, foreign policy. And this is something that at the UN, the current secretary general has really prioritized. And so um, I've had the privilege in the last years uh, of leading for the Security Council, the 15-year review on women, peace, and security, which had a real emphasis on evidence on the impact of women's participation. For the Secretary General, in the last four years, I've led his gender parity strategy, um, uh, which for the first time has achieved gender parity in the senior leaderships of the UN for the first time in 75 years. And I'll just end by saying that it actually makes a real difference. It makes a difference in what we talk about in meetings, makes a difference in the analysis, and it makes a difference in the outcomes. And that would be the reason why I think that's such a critical... Uh, well, thanks so much, Nyla, for, for leading us off and talking about the importance of, of women's leadership and giving us some clear examples of uh, how it's playing out in your own work. So over to you, Dr. Laura Parisi. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me this evening. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. And I'm honored to be on such an amazing panel with all these incredible women. Um, and thank you, Dr. McPhail, for moderating the session tonight. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, when I think about, I'm also the chair of gender studies at UVic. So um, I don't think I could answer the question about gender equality in three minutes or less. So I think I'm gonna take the question of empowerment. Um, and I think maybe what I have to say might dovetail quite nicely with the previous answer. Um, I think empowerment is a, in some ways, a word that we use all the time um, and that it means different things to different people. It's contested in the overall gender and development literature and among practitioners themselves. And so we often have this as a goal that we want to empower women and other marginalized uh, people, but it's not entirely clear what that means or what it entails. But for me and the work that I've been doing uh, these last few years, um, I've really come to see it in a couple of different ways around empowerment being um, at a very basic level, you know, the ability to make choices, life choices that have value, right, to the individuals that they weren't able to have before. And I mean meaningful choices, not like a choice between two negative outcomes, you know, whether you're gonna feed your kids or have, you know, firewood for your, um, your stove or that kind of thing. And when you add gender into it, it means expanding gender roles, not being hindered by particular gender roles, but it could also mean race, class, ethnicity uh, in a variety of ways. And I think when we talk about women's empowerment, oftentimes it gets very hung up on the question of gender rather than a more intersectional, right, kind of idea and thinking about the many identities that we all hold, right, that shape our ability to access resources and to political power and political participation. Um, and 
The other clear thing I want to say about, or maybe maybe not so clear, but the thing that I've come to understand empowerment as being is that it's a process, right? It's not an outgoing. It's not a uh, an outcome necessarily, right? It's not a static thing. We can't just say, okay, these people have been empowered because um, we now have, you know, more vaccines in this particular community, right? And so forth and so on. There's an individual level of process around empowerment, what that means to individuals about choosing lives and having the ability to live lives they value uh, is different to everyone as it is to communities. And I think historically we've talked about empowerment as something that we in Canada can give right to other people. And that's actually not the case, right? What we can hope for in a good, I think, foreign policy is that we enable the conditions for people to achieve what they want to achieve and they identify what they want to achieve. We don't decide for them. That's kind of an old top-down colonial model, right? Uh, foreign aid uh, and development. And I hope that we would move on from that. Um, at the same time, I'd like to see that mirrored here in our domestic policy uh, in Canada um, in a variety of ways. And hopefully we can talk about that later too, about the importance of Canadian domestic policy also mirroring what it's putting forth um, for the rest of the world. And um, I just wanna say, um, you know, the people that have taught me the most in, in some ways about empowerment are women I've worked with in very remote areas in Zambia, particularly in an economic cooperative. That's a lot of the work that I've been working on lately is with kind of alternative forms of economic empowerment. Um, and many of them um, can't read, but they're the best accountants I've ever seen, right? And they have goals, they have aspirations, they know what they need, right, in terms of making their basket uh, cooperative work, be successful, be profitable, have more voice on their governing council, which is 50% women and 50% men. Um, I have noticed, and just in, you know, in conjunction when we're talking about parity, um, in that particular case, it's been a struggle to actually have equal power and equal voice on that. So I hope we can take a more um, critical lens to that discussion as well, because there is a big discussion about, well, how do we include men in development who are always right, the biggest beneficiaries of economic development to begin with, that I think we're having a new conversation about that and what that looks like um, going forward. So that's all I'll say about it for now. Um, but I do hope we can talk a little bit too about, you know, what it means to um, enable conditions for long-term capacity change and transformation versus very short-term material tangible goals, uh, because that's huge in terms of thinking about how do we transform gender ideology, racial ideologies, and other kinds of structures that produce inequalities to begin with. Thank you. Okay, well, th thanks very much, Laura. Um, so really nice connections between our, our first two panelists. Um, so thank you for the, the sort of defining empowerment in terms of meaningful choice and that sort of making a connection to, you know, sort of our third round, I suppose, on actions, pointing out that um, one of the actions is to enable the conditions for long-term transformation. Um, okay, so I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Barbara Orser to set set the scene for some of her uh, remarks later on. So okay. if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and how you've used these these ideas, that would be great. Well, thank you, Dr. McPhail. And um, I'm fortunate this evening to be speaking from the unceded territory of the Shetsham uh, people in Terrace, BC. So glad to be joining Western colleagues. Um, I uh, hail from the University of Ottawa and, and I come out of a business school. And so my paradigm may be slightly different. Uh, I, I, my work focuses on leadership and engaging leadership within entrepreneurial context, policy context, managerial context. And so that's sort of the way I incorporate uh, some of the concepts that we'll be speaking about tonight, be it uh, through innovation, uh, organizational innovation, which means we're leveraging talent, be it engineering innovation, so the products are relevant, be it marketing innovation, so we're reaching and communicating to the right target markets, being attracting capital, or is it um, the opportunity to um, enhance customer value? 
So that's one paradigm that we can look at this from. Unfortunately, that paradigm tends to benefit uh, the least marginalized, the most privileged. And so when we think about women's economic imperative and, and empowerment, it extends also to ensuring that it's inclusive and that we are ensuring a diversity of uh, folks at the table. So what does that mean? It means that in my work, I'm working with public policymakers. An example would be working with Public Services and Procurement Canada to look at opportunities for women-owned businesses to secure contracts with the federal government. Some of my work touches on gender smart entrepreneurship education and training. And we're looking at how we can undertake gender-based analysis in entrepreneurship education in Kenya, Nigeria, Mexico, and Peru. And as the acting head of the W20, uh, one of the roles that I enjoy is actually levering some of the uh, policies and programs that are underway in Canada and extending um, some of that knowledge, mobilizing that knowledge to other cultural and geopolitical contexts. And I absolutely agree with Laura uh, with her comment about, we seem to tell other nations what to do well um, through our international, feminist international assistance policy, but it is uh, prudent to remember that we hold our domestic government agencies and private public organizations uh, to a different standard. And so perhaps we can come back to those comments as well as we try to ensure that uh, when we think about women's economic uh, empowerment in Canada, that we're, we're being true to the expectations of our international stakeholders. Uh, I think um, the, other, the other part of my work that some may find interesting is engagement in the private sector. And an example would be um, consultations with Scotiabank. Last year, Scotiabank launched a, five, a $3 billion initiative, uh, Scotiabank Women's Initiative to enhance financial literacy and financial knowledge. And in Canada, that couples a Bank of Montreal $2 billion initiative and a federal $5 billion initiative to support women entrepreneurs. So there's a tremendous amount of investment, but what does that mean when we're talking about economic empowerment and inclusion, when we're talking about small business and entrepreneurships? So part of the role is to ensure that it's context specific um, knowledge that we're mobilizing that's relevant to um, different cohorts, different sectors. So those are a couple of the projects that are underway and the way that I'm incorporating women's economic uh, empowerment and leadership uh, into my portfolio of action-based research. Okay, well, thank you very much. So um, I can certainly see that we've got uh, enormous uh, breadth of expertise here uh, from people working in leadership in the private sector, as Dr. Orser has just described, uh, and in the public sector. And um, as Dr. Parisi has pointed out, uh, of course, we have a lot of work to do at home as well. So I'm hoping that we can pick up on some of these themes as we, as we um, continue with this conversation. So thanks very much. I hope for the people listening in, it gives you a sense of the, the background of, of our panelists. So I'd like to turn now to the second issue that we've been asked to talk about, which is to focus in on the UN Women Report titled Turning Promises into Action, Gender Equality in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So just in terms of a little bit of background, um, in 2015, countries around the world committed to the achievement of 17 goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, by the year 2030. And this is known as the uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The 17 goals cover three main broad categories, namely economic, social, and environment. And they cover everything from full employment and decent work to trying to address poverty and inequality, as well as violence um, against women and the lack of health care, as well as climate change. So the 2030 agenda includes specific gender equality and empowerment goals, as well as recognizing that gender equality um, needs to be achieved within many of these other goals. So the UN Women 2018 report then provides a gender responsive framework for monitoring the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And I think it's really important now to recognize international efforts to promote gender equality. 
It's been 25 years since the Be Beijing Platform for Action and 40 years since the ratification of CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Making progress towards gender equality is being made even more urgent now by the COVID-19 pandemic. So with 17 goals, and I think 169 targets that are being used for monitoring, uh, it's completely overwhelming. Um, so I'm hoping that the, our panelists can guide us through, um, obviously not the whole report, but maybe just pick up on things that they find uh, the most interesting. So perhaps focusing on one goal or even some targets for one goal, from a gender perspective, what are the main gender gaps and issues? Where have there been some successes and where are some of the failures? And if that isn't enough to ask you, <laughs> I'm also going to ask if possible, if you could provide examples for specific countries and specific policies or programs. So I know that's, that's a lot, um, but if you could just tackle a couple of aspects which are of most interest to you. Um, so perhaps we'll just change up the order a little bit and start with Dr. Laura Parisi first. Thank you. That's a huge question. <laughs> I, um, I, uh, I, I guess I, I'm going to focus on, I have to say, um, I hadn't read the report in a while and I, I reread it this week and um, in sort of um, anticipation of our discussion here today. And for those of you who haven't read it, it's really rich. It's really interesting. Um, it has some incredibly, really good, solid feminist research um, and perspectives. I think it's one of the better things that the UN has produced um, in, in a while. So, um, and, I, and you can really see um, contributions from lots of points of view in the report. And for those of you who don't know, the sustainable development goals also apply to all countries. Um, this is what is different, right, than the millennium development goals that preceded it which were only applicable to the, um, to the developing countries. And so what makes it interesting in some ways to talk about gender equality is that we're now talking about it you know, globally, like truly globally, and trying to understand how it's, everything's connected globally. And um, an obvious one is the labor sector um, participation, which, the, um, which I'll leave to Barbara. <laughs> Uh, to discuss if she wants to. Um, but I think this is one way that women are connected globally, right, in terms of not being paid as much as men globally, and so forth and so on. We can see some themes that cut across level of development, right, of countries, and certainly gender-based violence is um, another one that the majority of people who suffer from violence based on their gender are women, self-identified women, uh, identified women, et cetera. Um, I think what I'd like to focus on most is the Sustainable Development Goal 5 and how it's so highlighted right, in um, the UN Women's Report. Uh, sustainable Development Goal number five is the one, the standalone Sustainable Development Goal on gender equality. The report does a great job of talking about which um, SDGs have really in-depth gender equality indicators and which do not and where we could have some improvement. Um, but I want to question a little bit the sort of uncritical acceptance of sustainable development goal number five that is um, included throughout right, the report. Um, no doubt it's a great improvement over uh, the previous Millennium Development Goal on gender equality, which really didn't cover a whole lot. Um, and what I want to say about it, and not to just be critical about it, but to maybe push our thinking about it as we move forward and accept what the limits of SDG 5 are. Um, and I'm going to focus on indicators because I've been doing a lot of work on indicators myself and the UN Women Report has a wonderful um, line in there going, well, indicators are just meant to indicate, right? So they're not formal tools of measurement, right? They're guiding us, they're giving us some sense um, of what is happening uh, globally. And indicators are really important. It's something that feminists fought for really in the 1970s. We had no idea, right, what the state of the world was for women, right, until then. I mean, when we talk about 
just now reaching gender parity in the UN after 75 years, it's so depressing given how much work um, has been done by feminists within um, these institutions and outside um, of these institutions. But I'm just gonna focus on a couple of things um, from sustainable development goal number five. Um, it does um, rightfully highlight the need to focus on uh, sexual health, and sexual and reproductive rights um, in SDG 5. But where the indicators are really limited and the report does acknowledge this, and I, but I think it kind of gets buried in there, is that the measurement and the focus is primarily on childbearing age women from ages 15 to 49. This leaves out <laughs> girls all right, um, under the age of 15. Um, and we know that in many countries, girls are sexually active and are in puberty way before the age of 15. Um, it also does not include women who aren't really having children. There's a heavy emphasis on maternal health, you know, um, so forth and so on. Um, it has kind of a heteronormative sort of aspect to it. You know, what if you don't need, um, you know, reproductive health per se and what that means. Um, it leaves out older women altogether. I, mean, I, I'm not, I would not be included in that statistic. I'm 51. So, you know, when we're doing indicators of sexual health and reproductive health and rights, I think that's an important thing that to understand and understand what the implication is. And I think there's a good push in the report to say, hey, we actually need more. This is too narrow, right? And this, we need to do more with this type of indicator. It doesn't leave a lot of room for those who are self-identified women. They may not be biological women, like the way that the language is framed um, around sexual health and reproductive rights. So I think that's an important question. Um, and in terms of participation, um, and Nala may have more to share on this, but one of the things that struck me on the indicator for effective um, participation in you know, whatever um, realm that we're doing a measurement on was that it really is just an indicator of numbers of women, right? In you know, particular levels of government, right, in the economy, in the labor force, right, that doesn't measure effectiveness, <laughs> or doesn't indicate effectiveness, right, it just indicates that we have more women or less women, right, in um, these sectors, and so I would, you know, and that kind of goes along with that question of empowerment in some ways, um, you know, what do people understand effective and meaningful participation to be, and how can we capture that, right, as um, an indicator that these types of goals are working, that the frameworks are working, you know, the, the kinds of weight, the policies that we're implementing um, are they're there. And so for me, those are kind of two big things that jump out is because there's a lot of that guiding, you know, in the report um, about that, about those particular issues and how do we understand, right, effectiveness. And finally, what I want to say about indicators and gender equality, and we didn't really get to a definition of gender equality, but maybe I can say a little something right now about how I understand gender equality in the work that I do, right? That it's not just about adding women and stirring to existing systems, right? So I see Nala nodding her head. Uh, and I think we are at that point where, okay, we know from the lessons of the 70s, right, that just adding women to the labor force, just adding women to, um, you know, particular programs and so forth that weren't really designed for them, you know, based on socialization of gender, right, and so forth and so on, um, isn't that effective, but it's still a pretty dominant model that we have in international development. And it competes with what I would say are more complex understandings of gender and really understanding gender is not a biological category or you're a man or you're a woman, right? Just understanding how the ideologies of feminization and masculinization work. There are many men who are feminized, right? And marginalized. Um, and so it's relational and it's not binary. And I think that's a more complex understanding of how gender operates ideologically. And I think one of the important things to remember, and I think this was, uh, oh, my mind's going blank, um, about an important idea that, I wanna get the right person the right <laughs> credit for it, but I, I'll come back to it when I think of her name. But I think an important aspect of thinking about how these gender equality indicators work 
is that we have to question whether women are equalizing up in these gender equality indicators or men are equalizing down, right? We don't actually have that context often when we see these statistics that come out in these, um, these big reports, right? And I remember that Fatima Mernissi and others many years ago wrote, well, why would we want what men have, right, in our countries? Because what they have isn't that great either, right? <laughs> so when Nala talks about, you know, empowerment uh, and more inclusivity and diversity, having better outcomes for everyone, I think that's a really critical thing to think about when we look at indicators, you know, what's being captured. And indicators are silos. Right? We don't have a lot in the UN report does a great job of talking about how it's not very intersectional. Right? We don't know much about the difference between women's experiences in the upper classes and middle class or based on race, ethnicity, caste, right? sexual identity or gender identity. Um, and so as we move forward, I think that's a good place um, to start um, to think about how SGGs are actually being applied in those contexts. I'll leave it there. Well, th thanks very much for starting us off I mean, um, and giving us a good overview about how SDGs have, you know, are, are an improvement over the previous Millennium Development Goals, but pointing out still many of the limitations, what they're leaving out in terms of uh, ages, identity, and that they are just, they are numbers, so they're not talking about uh, effectiveness of leaders. And I certainly related to what you were talking about, the, 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 the um, feminization can sometimes be feminization downwards. And so it reminds me of the work of Guy Standing who talked about the feminization of the labor force with women moving into the labor force, but he also meant that it was the uh, deterioration of, of working conditions for, all, for men as well as for women. Um, so you've certainly introduced some nuances there when we, that we should keep in mind when we look at these indicators. Um, so perhaps I can turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Barbara Orser. Okay, well, thank Your you. A couple of remarks. Yeah, I too have focused when I was looking at the report on SDG 5 and specifically um, the need to reform um, opportunities to provide women equal access to economic resources to enhance the use of enabling technologies, particularly information communication and technology and to adapt and strengthen sound policies and enforceable legislation. And at no time has this been more important given the gender regressive impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was already mentioned by Nala, but we're really seeing the amplification of these structural inequalities. So let's just sort of tear these apart for just a minute. When I think about economic resources, if we take the UN report and we, we sort of contemporize it by what we've seen come into the market in response to COVID-19. Um, Chatham House, the OECD, UN Women, um, UN We Empower have come out with some excellent reports that really speak to the nuances of what we're talking about in those development goals and how we need to be very granular and specific in our policy priorities and our investments for um, an intervention recovery strategy. So economic resources, I'm thinking access to capital, technology, talent, opportunity for advancement. Um, access to capital, again, my work in entrepreneurship, we know that women-owned businesses have been hardest hit disproportionately. They're smaller, less likely to um, sustain the economic shock, less likely to work with a bank, over 60 OECD reported countries have introduced relief measures, but a lot of women aren't working with the banks to access that kind of relief capital. Or the criteria are such that their businesses are too small, or they employ contract workers, or they're self-employed. And many of these relief, not even recovery measures, don't cover that category of worker. They may be gig workers who were, um, are now unemployed. So access to capital in terms of relief, access to capital in terms of growing their businesses, be it debt capital, lending from banks, or equity capital associated with growth. Um, some may be interested actually in Canada to know that, and it's not well known, but that on average, women own 
loan applications are more likely to be approved, according to Statistics Canada, according to Scotiabank Research. That's atypical globally, so countries can learn from Canada. Part of the challenge is encouraging or thinking about um, ensuring that women feel comfortable uh, seeking and acquiring some of these resources. Let's think about ICT and technology. Given that we're on Zoom, uh, we've moved education to a digital distance learning in many economies. Many businesses have had to move to e-platforms quickly. As educators, we're seeing the acquisition of digital content, which is macho, masculine, and represents lots of occupational bias. So in terms of technology and ICT, we need to ensure that women and girls are being given access to affordable digital technologies. And in the case of education, when they have that, they're the ones that get educated instead of the brother who is given the priority on the laptop or the cell phone. So digital technologies is access, affordability, time to do that. Access to markets. And, and I talked about being involved with Public Services and Procurement Canada trying to increase access to, to contracts for Canadian businesses, but women need access to markets to grow their businesses, to work women to women, to identify new customers. And an important source of that can be through government or public procurement. And so there's lots of opportunity to do that. The U.S. has started to do that. Well, they've been at it for 30 years on a women-owned business program. Research undertaken at Telfer indicates marginal impact when you control for size and sector of firm both in terms of bid frequency and bid success. So we need to be pretty critical on some of these indicators, but also how we're monitoring and reporting on these indicators. And in preparing for this panel, we were asked to think about, you know, some of the limitations of these indicators. So I just want to share a couple of sort of thoughts or tips when we're looking at these indicators, because these SDG five goals are being amplified by all the reports I mentioned earlier. One, we need to be very careful about averaging. A case in point, in Canada, we study innovation. If you say, well, are women more innovative than men in terms of their businesses? If you average it all out, you'll get yes. But if you break it down, we see there are huge differences in rates of innovation in terms of type of innovation. If it's product innovation, the answer is yes. If it's a marketing innovation, yes. If it's organizational, no. If it's process, no. That matters. We need granularity in how we monitor innovation. Um, the other point I'm going to make is ensuring that we're using um, the temporal context. And here is access to capital I'm going to comment on. Often I hear reports that were predicated on data 20 years ago. Things are changing so quickly that I think the bias has to be data within the last five years, if not with explanation. And an example would be the access to digital wallets, the access to digital capital, um, self-employment rates. In Canada, we hear women are twice as likely to be self-employed, not true. If we look at a 40 year rate, maybe. If we look at a 20 year rate, absolutely not. The rate of self-employment among women in Canada is about 1% per year. About For men, about 1% increase net change per year. So let's make sure we're monitoring the temporal context and avoiding the averaging that I think leads us down um, uh, policy routes that may not be appropriate. So just a couple of thoughts on the SDG5. Okay, well, thanks very much. So, um, Another few reminders about what we need to think about when we're looking at some of these uh, uh, indicators. And I particularly appreciated the idea that um, we need to think about not only gender gaps in terms of access to things like capital, but also how programs need to be developed differently to in order to ensure that women can access those um, programs. So the capital being the, the key one here, that the thresholds actually need to be different. So I think that's a really important point. So I'd like to turn now to Nyla Valji for her thoughts on this particular question. 
Great. Thanks very much, uh, Fiona. And I think just to echo, as the as the colleagues have already said, you know, the sustainable development goals were adopted um, uh, in 2015. Um, they are our global agenda for people, prosperity, and planet. They are the blueprint uh, to uh, to show us the way to live sustainably with each other, uh, and uh, and with our planet. And the reality is, is that if we had invested more in the past five years, if we had been further along in the implementation of the SDGs, um, which cover everything from the environment, equality, education, uh, uh, health, the range, of, the range of issues that we've been talking about, if we'd invested more and been further along, the impact of this, of this crisis at the moment of this pandemic um, uh, and the aggravation of economic inequality that we're seeing would not be having the same, uh, the same impact that it is today. And so I think it's really important that we're talking about the sustainable development goals and we're looking at how it is that we double down on these. These are not just the responsibility of governments, these are the responsibilities of, of individuals, of companies. Um, the private sector and companies have a massive role to play in helping us to achieve uh, uh, that blueprint, including goal five on gender equality, which I'll come back to in one second. But I want to just pick up on something that, that, that Laura mentioned and, uh, you know, the, the reality about the indicators, the, um, uh, the, the fact that we have a dedicated gender equality goal, it's still not quite where we would want it to be. But I think it's important for us to remember that, as I said, this was a global agenda, which means that it was negotiated between 193 countries, the member states of the United Nations. And it is, I believe, a small miracle that we have what we have in there. Um, but I think that we need to treat it as a floor and not a ceiling. Um, and we need to keep building up from it. We need to keep pointing out and highlighting where are the gaps um, uh, where do we need to be more focused? You know, we, we say that one of the underpinning principles are, are universality, so it applies everywhere, um, but also the principle, uh, the principle of leaving no one behind. And I think that's really where the intersectionality um, uh, uh, comes in. And so whilst we might not name the vulnerable groups, there might be political issues to uh, exposing some of these, but if we can focus on that principle of leaving no one behind, I think it opens the door again, as I said, for this to be a floor and, and, and not a ceiling. But it is critically important that we're that we are um, uh, focused on that and and on the most vulnerable uh, as we're as we're delivering on this uh, on this agenda. Maybe just to say on the UN Women report, and I'm not going to speak to it because it is a comprehensive, really um, well structured and thought through um, uh, report. And I would encourage everybody to have a quick look at it, even if you just have a look at the data across uh, across different countries. The summary report. Um, there's just a lot of good points in there to, to be aware of, but I think what I'll say is that the report itself is important, um, uh, not just because of, what it, uh, because of what it says on the SDGs, but because it is one of the few reports that we have that disaggregates our data and our statistics from a gender perspective. And that is really critically important. And this is one of the directions in which we need to be moving as we're implementing the sustainable development goals is we need to keep disaggregating our data and we need to be asking the question continuously, where are the women? Because we are not going to implement effectively if we're not aware of that. And unfortunately in international development over the years, we have too easily um, had, had blanket and global statistics, as the colleagues have mentioned, um, that really have masked where women, where women are and what, what women's experiences uh, have been. Uh, one of my favorite uh, books of, of, of this year, and I highly recommend it to everybody, is called Invisible Women. And it's a great read, it's a best-selling read that really makes accessible the impact of not having disaggregated data of, make, of rendering women invisible, uh, essentially. Um, and of the fact that we've had a, um, uh, what, what the author terms, a male default bias uh, in everything from our policy to our medical research in every sector of our lives. And that has real impacts. It has impacts on, uh, on things like um, uh, the fact that women are more likely or were more likely until a few years ago uh, to be seriously injured in car accidents because the te crash test dummies that we use are male default 70 kilogram, um, uh, six foot tall men. Um, and, and obviously uh, uh, crashes will not impact women in the same way as, as they would a 70 kilogram man. That's just one really benign, not so benign in real life in terms of its outcomes, but one example of the way in which we, when we miss data and when we default to a male bias, 
but it has real world, world impacts. And that has impacts in terms of how we build cities, where we spend our money, how we construct institutions, what are the policies and, and um, uh, institutional programs that we, that we implement. It really impacts every piece of our lives. And so having this data, having this analysis that you and women is putting out there um, is, is, is really important. I'll just end by, uh, you, you asked Fiona for one of the biggest gaps that we see um, uh, in terms of implementation at the moment. And the gap that I would highlight is, is uh, something that Laura's already mentioned, which is violence against women and girls. Um, you know, in, in the past year, 18% uh, uh, of women um, uh, were likely to have experienced some form of violence in their family and intimate partner relationships uh, over, um, uh, over the last year. And those are figures that we had prior to COVID. We have seen a global spike in violence across the world, including in Canada, um, alongside this pandemic and a massive increase uh, in, in, in violence against women and girls. And this is really critical because insecurity and violence against women and girls is not just a violation of their rights to security and dignity and health and the knock-on impacts that it has across the board, um, but it really is um, uh, it really affects every single one of the goals that we're trying to achieve in the Sustainable Development Goals. And this is, um, uh, you know, domestic violence, sexual violence, um, uh, bullying and harassment online. We've seen an incredible spike in that. We've also seen in many countries around the world a spike in child marriage. And girls being married off at 15, 16 years old means that they're not finishing their education. It impacts the, um, the, the income of their family, of their community. It increased maternal mortality because they're more likely to have children when they's not ready to. Um, uh, it just the knock on impact on lifetime impacts, not just on them, but on intergenerational uh, inequality is, is massive. And if we are not focused there and if we're not focused, on addressing violence against women and girls is, is, is really a critical issue that we need to be investing in. We're not going to be able to achieve the rest of the goals in the way that we want to. Thanks very much, Nyla. You gave us a, a lot of information um, and encouraged, I think, all of us to go and read, read the report or, ourselves. So thanks very much. I'm conscious of the time. Um, so what I would like to do is just turn to uh, the, the last, we'll make this the last round, um, strategies and actions which Canada can take to support women's leadership, um, both domestically and internationally, as I was reminded uh, of when a couple of our panelists spoke earlier. Um, this, of course, is a very broad area as women leaders work across all levels from the local to national to international. Women work as elected leaders and politicians, as well as in managerial and leadership roles in government and enterprises and various institutions, including NGOs and research organizations. Most importantly, there are differences among women by race, class, sexual orientation, religion, identity, and, and so on. And these differences give rise to variation in the barriers, issues, and, and strategies. I just want to draw your attention to um, something which I found out uh, preparing for this uh, panel, which is that the UN Women's Theme for International Women's Day for March 2021 is Women in Leadership Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. And I think earlier in the panel, uh, Nyla pointed out that uh, women leaders have positively intervened to lessen the disastrous impacts of COVID-19. Uh, which has been attributed to their greater emphasis on social and environmental well-being over time. So I know we're running out of time, but I'm just wondering if each of the panelists would like to talk a little bit about uh, why we need women leaders and how we can increase women's full and effective participation in leadership roles within Canada and internationally. So I guess I'd like to start with Dr. Barbara Orser, um, let her go first this time, but if you can keep, if everyone can keep their remarks at, you know, just two or three minutes, um, that would be great. And then we'll move to the question and answers uh, where you'll, no doubt you'll have the opportunity to elaborate on some of your, your um, your answers. So over to you, Barbara. Okay. And I, I want to open by picking up on the point about uh, the importance of gender and sex segregated data. I think one of the reasons we're not seeing the accountability of governments to, um, to reach the, the SDG five goals and other goals is um, lack of evidence-based policy. 
Um, and so until we have more robust um, data gathering mechanisms and Canada still is, is a good practice uh, nation, um, it enables governments to, um, to you know, avoid reporting on and being accountable for um, those development goals. So that undermines everything that I, I think or am about to say. I think there's opportunity for more private, public, uh, civil society engagement. One of the things I've, I've observed is feminist, grassroots, women's advocate organizations tend to push these agenda forward. But when it comes to reporting, monitoring, and um, developing strategy, contracts are typically let to large global consultancies, undermining the feminist efforts that have informed um, the establishment of goals. And I think government needs to stop doing that. I think we need funding, more funding for feminist grassroots women's, uh, women identified organizations, because if we don't support the infrastructure, and often these are, are poorly funded organizations with little clout, they're not invited to the table at the ministerial level when um, standards and policies are being enacted. Um, it's almost taking advantage of the knowledge, but not engage them in engaging them in the process of policy and program enactment. So more engagement in not only advising on policy goals, but actually on delivering uh, policy and programs, including investments and spend. So more partnerships, um, more infrastructure support. And from my own perspective, I think at least in Canada, we need to, and I open my comments by saying we need to better align our domestic and our international policies. And we need to make sure that our policies are, are, are bold and true. Um, I'm thinking of Lujan al Hathal and the other women that are incarcerated in Saudi Arabia. We just finished a G20 meeting and um, her case has now been sent to a terrorist court. I don't know how we can develop a trade policy in Canada with Saudi Arabia when we're seeing the incarceration of women champions. So Canada and other economies must protect and um, lobby and undertake um, uh, conversations to secure um, and protect feminist leaders and other kind of champions of change. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Orser. Uh, so Nyla Valji, do you want to take it up from there? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, when it comes to Canada's leadership and, and, um, uh, and, and, and what it needs to do in its, in its foreign and domestic policy, I would say, and I would link this to the other part of your question with regards to COVID, I think that as, as we are recovering from this pandemic and from this crisis, uh, Canada needs to model leadership and it needs to invest in that consistently both at home uh, and abroad. Uh, and it needs to make visible women's leadership and the effectiveness of women's leadership and meaningful participation. I was reading a really disturbing survey just earlier this morning um, uh, about, um, despite the fact, as I said, we've had unprecedented visibility to the, to the effectiveness of women's leadership during these past months. And yet they asked the question across the world of whether uh, men and women trust uh, women leaders or would want to see a woman leader in their country. And the numbers are still incredibly low and they are particularly low amongst young men which is disturbing because you would, have, you, you would expect to see generational change. But what they did find is that in countries that have had women leaders or where there have been significant uh, women in senior positions um, that have modeled women in leadership, that, the, that those numbers look different than they do um, uh, in, in other contexts. And so I think for that reason, it's important um, uh, that Canada is, is modeling that leadership, um, uh, is consistent in encouraging other countries uh, as well. And I would just link that to one thing uh, you know, the, the, the COVID, we've, we've alluded to the fact that the COVID-19 impact has been particular for women. Economically, they, many, are, many economists are referring to this as a, as a she session or the pink recession. It is the first time that we are seeing uh, the impact on women's unemployment um, uh, far more significant uh, than it has been on men's unemployment for, for, a range of, uh, for a range of reasons. The increase in violence that I, the, the, that I mentioned, uh, et cetera. But, what I would also mention here is something that is often invisible in our policy conversations and is finally coming to the fore, and that is the care economy. Women's unpaid care work has gone through the roof with this pandemic. 
Globally, women do three times more unpaid care work than men. In some countries, that is up to 11 times more. That is time that is not being spent in productive labor, in earning an income, in education um, uh, and, and, and other areas. And as that exacerbates, um, uh, it increases the inequalities. The flip side of that, though, is that an investment in the care economy actually can be a core part of, of our recovery um, globally. When you invest in the care economy, that's quality care for, 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 elder, uh, for elderly persons, that's universal child care. Um, you not only equalize society, you free up time from traditional gender roles for women to participate more in the labor force with, an, with a knock-on impact. So you get that dual resulting of increased jobs and increased um, uh, free time uh, as well. So I think that that those would be the two issues that I would say that we really need to focus on domestically and internationally uh, is women's leadership, modeling it, being consistent in our investment and, and, um, uh, and, and calling uh, for it on the global stage, and the issue of investing in, in the care economy consistently uh, in all countries. Okay, thanks very much, Nyla. Um, so I guess it's last words to you, uh, Dr. Laura. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you raised the care economy because I was going to do that and you did such a great job. I don't need to say anything else about that. And also Barbara's points are extremely well taken and important. Um, I do want to say a couple things, uh, maybe about uh, funding and how uh, programs are being funded. Um, one of the things um, we do have this feminist international assistance policy. I've written a couple of articles about it. And um, what is increasingly clear to me is that our funding commitments, despite, you know, oh, hey, all of our new, you know, international development projects are going to be, you know, have gender equality at the center, right, which is hugely important. I'm not going to downplay that at all. It's also hugely important that it's being called a feminist policy, right? That's a very um, bold and political claim to make. Um, but the funding has not increased at all um, since the Harper government. <laughs> so we have a lot of window dressing around feminism and gender equality um, at the domestic level that is being translated into Canada being heralded as having this amazing feminist international assistance policy, which is now talking about, you know, developing the feminist uh, foreign policy um, in which uh, many in the sector in Canada have been asked to contribute comments that are due on Monday, by the way, about what should a feminist foreign policy look like. <laughs> um, and so I think there's some interesting things happening there. Um, and so I think the funding piece is really important. And I think one of the things that Barbara brought up is um, public private partnerships. And increasingly governments around the world, including Canada, are relying on the public sector, private sector, sorry, to fund right, gender equality initiatives and kind of pick up the slack so that the government themselves doesn't have to invest the kind of money, I think what Nala is talking about and what we would all like to see, right, is a real commitment um, to that. Um, and so we're relying on the private sector that has very little accountability. Um, we don't get much say in who those public-private partnerships are. Um, for example, Canada's uh, public-private sector partnerships with uh, mining company, companies <laughs> uh, globally consistently undermine gender equality, contribute to environmental degradation, violate indigenous um, sovereignty, and so forth and so on. Um, so I think we need to be more insistent about a human rights approach, right, to um, a lot of these questions when we talk about the global economy, because there's a lot of structural violence in the global economy that goes unacknowledged, even in the UN Women's Report. Right, is that violence is often understood as like what one person does to another or what a community does to another, but it doesn't acknowledge systemic and structural violence. And so when you talk about violence globally, I think we also need to include that conversation about how systems can be violent um, and what does that mean uh, in terms of eradicating gender equality. And finally, I'll just say one tiny little other piece um, maybe people are aware of this and they're not, but um, Canada has engaged in a number of new trade agreements that have a gender chapter right in the trade agreements. And I think these are really important, at least symbolic steps <laughs> um, forward 
And I think that we can here at home push the government to be um, more accountable and supporting those trade agreements. But the trade agreements themselves don't have much teeth, right, in terms of enforcing or mechanizing gender equality. For example, they don't require countries to har be harmonized in terms of their gender equality goals. They don't state any gender equality goals. They don't acknowledge that actually sometimes certain forms of trade are harmful to women's economic empowerment, right? But again, I think this is kind of the ways that we can think about how do we move forward? We have tools. If the government's putting them out there, then we can put them, hold them accountable for how those tools right, are being used and shaping our foreign policy right, with other countries. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, well, that was that was great. Thank you very much to, to all three of you. You've certainly given us lots to, to think about how we might um, individually or collectively act to uh, try to support uh, women leaders and increase the number of leaders, uh, women leaders and um, and what sorts of things that they might work on. Um, so I've actually lost the um, Q and A button on my on my Zoom, so I'm unable to um, ask the question. So I'm wondering if somebody from CIC Communications can either tell me how to get the button back or to. Uh, uh, ask the questions. Uh, of course. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A function. Um, Dr. Raphael, if you do not see the question and answer function, do you see the little button in the bottom there? No, it seems to have gone. I did when we were talking earlier, but now it's actually gone. Um, would it be okay if I ask um, panelists the questions that we have? Yes, I think so. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so hello once again, I'm Asu Patel, the um, events VP for um, uh, CIC. So just to jump into the first question here, um, we have this from Holly Liu. I will just read out the question. Um, good evening, ladies. I work for a consulting and accounting firm, and the firm is the seventh largest accounting network in the world. So luckily, our firm has the leading inclusivity advisory committee, and till 2020, 23% of our partners are female. Because of the leading inclusivity advisory committee, females like me and also in the junior level could participate and my voice can be heard. I can empower my participation to improve gender equality. I want to ask if someone is not lucky as I am, what kind of platform they can have in, in a firm? So I'll start off with um, Dr. Parisi, you wanna go ahead? I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like more of a question that um, Barbara could could answer more effectively than I could. I think it's an interesting yeah. question, though, about how how do you build those kinds of platforms, right? For in institutions where there's lots of power hierarchies and there's more, it's more male dominated. Um, so, and certainly we see that in universities, you know, mm -hmm. everywhere. So, but um, yeah, I'll turn it over to Barbara. Okay, yeah, if I think about um, good practice consultancies that are undertaking accounting, I think of Accenture. Accenture has a global initiative where their executives have committed to women's advancement publicly. That is somewhat unique. So do a quick Google on, on gender and Accenture and you'll see some uh, one or two outstanding reports. New generation reports in that their econometrics are now estimating the impact of not advancing women into leadership roles. So when the economic arguments have moved beyond it's good for business and, and you know some basic indicators of economic outcomes to this is what it's costing your firm by not advancing women. I'd also point you to McKinsey. Uh, they have a number of reports as well. Um, so those, those would be the two top global leads I think in that space. Um, now if you, you're shaking your head, are there any other reports you can think of? Not reports that I can think of. Um, uh, I'm just thinking right now, we're actually partnering with Catalyst um, mm -hmm. uh, to get them to come in and run inclusion dialogues with us and, and um, hopefully to, to disrupt people's bias, to get them thinking a little bit about, about unconscious bias, how we create more inclusive um, uh, work uh, workspaces um, and also look at how entrenched hierarchies and inequalities disadvantage. Um, uh, and as, as Barbara said, how, how that impacts economically and on the culture of the organization as a whole. I might just add one quick thing um, that 
if an organization, um, and I know several of the universities in um, BC did this a number of years ago, when you have an inclusivity committee or anybody who's working on these issues can do a system-wide um, kind of salary review. Um, we did that at UVic, right? Just looking at salaries for men and women right across the campus and faculty. And that's just kind of one way to put things out mm -hmm. there. You know, it's not so much about doing that training and that dialoguing that maybe a different way, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to talk about equity and inclusion that, um, that companies can kind of see in very hard numbers, so to speak, right? Yeah. Where there are problems and where there are issues. And so that's maybe one potential avenue to think about. Thank you. And for the next question, Dr. McPhail, if you do have insights also, feel free to uh, go on and answer. So um, the next question is, how do Canadian companies register in another country so as to establish a presence and apply for funding with that country, especially now that there are new Canada, US, UK trade agreements in place? Anybody prefer to take this question on first? No, I think I'm going to jump in on that one, <laughs> simply because of my work on women in export. Um, so a couple of suggestions. Uh, Global Affairs Canada is your first point of entry. Um, and I would work with a sector expert uh, with Global Affairs. And their role as trade commissioners is to hold your hand and to act on your behalf to help you troubleshoot. And in many economies, they have their own personnel on the ground, ground to help you register. If you're a women-owned business owner, uh, there are also a number of initiatives in Canada. I'm assuming it's a Canadian asking the question. Um, the Organization for Women in International Trade is a cross-sector organization, OWIT. I do a quick Google there. Women's Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub uh, situated at the Diversity Institute at, the Uni at Ryerson University has a very helpful platform that you can search on programs that can help you identify you know, what country, what kind of trade promotion strategy you may want to access. Export Development Corporation, EDC Canada, also has women-focused uh, support, particularly around COVID. So again, if you're a women-owned business owner, do women entrepreneurs and EDC, and you'll um, look at some, you may come up with some programming there as well. But in terms of actually registering the business, I'd go to Global Affairs. Thank you. Would anybody else like to um, add in here? I could most definitely jump onto the next question then. Um, so this is for um, Ms. Valji. Uh, hi, I was wondering what further steps you think the UN should take to inspire gender equity around the world? An interesting question. Um, I mean, I think, as I said, that you know, the Secretary General has had a real focus on this from uh, from his first days in office um, internally with uh, with gender parity, but also holding our senior leadership to account how much money we're spending on on gender equality programming, the integration across all of our pillars, peace and security, development, human rights, making sure that this is at the center of everything that we're doing. So, for example, uh, the Secretary General has a new call to action on on human rights, and within that is a gender pillar. Um, uh, and we've decided on two strategic interventions uh, within that that we're focused on. One is temporary special measures for women's leadership and, and, uh, and participation. Um, but I think really trying to model internally in the UN what it is that, that, that states should be doing themselves, holding them to account, ensuring that it's part of, uh, part of the dialogues that, um, uh, that, that um, everyone is, is having with member states and then supporting them. I think that you know, uh, it, it has to be, you can, you, can, um, you can call out where we see violations and problems, but we also have to be there to, to support. Um, and so uh, uh, I think it is that, that twin track and, and particularly right now is we're trying to develop and, and, and support governments in, um, uh, in delivering on the sustainable development goals, making sure that they understand goal five and the indicators that we have across all of them on, on gender equality is critically important. So research convening, convenings is really a critical part of what we do. Um, highlighting good practice, um, uh, supporting governments in their efforts. I think those are all of the, all of the things that the UN tries to do in this space. Thank you. And would anybody like to add into that, add on to that question? I can uh, jump into our next one then. Um, so what are disparities uh, faced between women in the global north and global south? This is a um, wide and broad question, of course. Um, so does anybody want to start? 
Ms. Balaji, maybe you can jump on in this one. Disparities between women, the global um, north and south. Sure. I mean, you know, really the challenges that women face in, in um, developed versus developing economies are, are often very different, but they're often very common. Uh, the nature of the inequality, the scale, the scope, um, uh, the depth of the inequality might be might be different, but I think many of the challenges are are the same, and that is the reason why it's so important that the Sustainable Development Goals are a universal uh, agenda. There is no single country in the world where we have achieved gender equality. There is no country in the world where women's rights um, are, are fully respected. There's no country in the world where uh, women don't experience um, uh, violence um, uh, in, in different spheres of their lives. And so um, whilst those challenges are different, the scale, scale scope, nature of it um, uh, differs. I think that they are, they are similar. They are, you know, access to the economy, the digital divide, violence, um, uh, the, the, the barriers to participation, um, uh, the barriers to, to education. Um, uh, they, they, I, I think that they're all, they're all common, but they, they take different forms and, and, and scale, I would say. Thank you, um, Dr. Orser. I, I want to reinforce that message. I think, you know, in, in all of my reading and, and looking at this exemplary report by the UN, if you look at the uh, W20 uh, communicated from 2020, it maps very well onto the UN report. Um, it may be difference in scale. It may be difference in cultural context, but the issues are so similar globally, it's remarkable. And so, Many of these templates are absolutely relevant to all economies because no economy has achieved uh, gender equality. So uh, more parallels than differences, but sometimes a difference in scale and scope and perhaps legislative frameworks that protect uh, labor rights and other things like access to capital. Dr. Parisi, if you wanted to go ahead on that. Um, sure. The one thing I might say that I think is a huge disparity um, between Global North and Global South is, for women in particular, is access to land rights and to water. Um, I think those are quite qualitatively different um, experiences that in the Global North, you know, women can have credit and women have access to things that can be collateral, maybe not at the same scale as men, but versus women in many countries that have no access to credit, have no collateral, have no um, land rights, can't inherit land, um, and so forth and so on. So I think that is a massive difference between the global north and the global south. Um, and the other thing I want to say is about access to water. I was going to mention it earlier in the very beginning, but thinking about climate change and access to water, um, that goes along with access to land, right, um, and to clean water. And you know, we haven't done a great job here in Canada, right? There's many uh, indigenous reserves in Canada that are under water boil advisory and don't have clean water of their own. Um, but you know, particularly in the work that I've done with women in um, Zambia and other places, you know, water is kind of at the top of their agenda. Right? because it affects right, the quality of their care work, right? um, their ability to participate in the economic, um, uh, economic realm, uh, the ability to educate either themselves or their children. Like water is like kind of a fundamental um, key part to it. And I think in the global north, we have pretty good you know, access to water, not you know, 100%, but far more right, than in many other countries. And women do primarily the, uh, the labor in collecting water. right? So when we're talking about time poverty and all of these other things that we talked about earlier, like how care work takes a lot of time, so it does you know, collecting water and so forth. Um, and so, and the UN report does a nice job, I think, of pointing out about how the land rights issue and the um, water issue in the SDGs doesn't really have any gender dimension to it at all. One of them are in fact highly gendered um, issues. And so I wonder just secretly, privately about what the negotiation was around <laughs> those particular SDGs um, and, and why that's the case. And I think we can continue to look at that. I think that's an important difference that we see. Thank you. Um, so I believe this question is also for Dr. Orser. Um, we know women on boards improve overall business performance. In spite of this, we are far from it. What are your thoughts on how we can get more women on boards to support the business case? 
quotas. If you look at the evidence, quotas work. And what tends to happen is boards get larger and women join boards. I think that, um, you know, comply or explain is, is, is as, uh, inspirational, admirable quotas. I, I really think we need to move there quickly or we'll be talking about this in 20 years. That one I have a hard stop on. <laughs> I'd be curious actually to know what my colleagues think of that. But, but we haven't seen that happen in Canada. Uh, women are, are able to engage in, in um, nonprofit boards. A lot of them are being credentialed through programs like through University of Ottawa, Rotman School of Management. They're not landing corporate boards. They're landing nonprofit volunteer boards. So I think, I think we have a mechanism that we know works and we haven't yet utilized that. Asma, maybe if I can just add to that and say I'm a I'm a huge advocate of of quotas. I fully agree, Barbara. I think that uh, uh, quotas and and you know what we what we call temporary special measures more generally um, are are really critically important. Um, we and and this is across sectors. This is not just corporate boards. It's got to be political representation. It's it's just got to be across the board. We cannot be sitting around twiddling our thumbs, waiting for change to, to come when there are so many barriers, the, 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 the building up of the institutional policy, attitudinal barriers that prevent women in all institutions from, um, uh, from moving ahead can only be dismantled when you place women in positions of leadership. And as I said about that survey earlier today, when you place women in positions of, 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 of leadership, it's a self-reinforcing cycle. And I think, Laura, just to go back to a point you mentioned earlier about, about participation and intersectionality, and I I fully agree with you, but I think that once we once we uh, increase the number of women in leadership positions, I think we open the door. It's it's a tide that raises all boats. Um, I think that we see institutional change. I think it's a it's a self reinforcing cycle. I think you you bring more women into institutions, you transform the institutions because uh, women are more likely to uh, to to change things to, to be more diverse and to be more inclusive and to, um, to also accommodate um, uh, uh, the needs and views and perspectives of, 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 of a broader um, uh, constituency. So I, I really think that quotas are, are the way in which we start to transform institutions and we do the rest of it around, around that. And I, and I don't think in Canada, we've had a, a, a public conversation about why with a feminist government, we haven't moved to a quota around uh, boards. And I really do appreciate this question because when we're talking about leadership, uh, corporate leadership is really important because it, it, you know, it's a source of deployment of, of community resources and priority setting. And um, you know, we've ended up with this legislation that, that I don't think serves the outcome. I mean, if we look at the outcomes or impact of that legislation, it's marginal change. Uh, if any, right? So, so what's wrong with quotas? Why aren't we seeing our feminist government advancing what we know works to change the board composition of uh, corporate Canada? I appreciate I you. think the answer lies in that we haven't done it in the public sector either. <laughs> I mean, yes, we have a gender equal cabinet, but that's it in the federal government. I mean, we have a, an electoral system that does not benefit women and other marginalized people that, you know, we, we know proportional representation systems work better in terms of electing um, people from other parts of society to government. Our political parties aren't required to have quotas either. Some take them on voluntarily, but not all of them, right? So I think we don't see it. We don't see it, that legislation or that mandate because we don't actually have it, right? Um, in our governments, either provincially or federally. And so I think that's part of it, right? That, you know, institutionally, it kind of all has to start kind of together before that can happen. I mean, when you look in the educational sector, I mean, you're at the University of Ottawa and, you know, UVic just hired its eighth president, another white male. Despite all the gains we've had <laughs> for women in higher education in the last couple of decades, more women are enrolled in universities now than men, which is kind of interesting when we think about the labor sector and all of these things. You know, why is it that we barely have any uh, women presidents of universities who are producing right future labor force 
you know, in, in university. So there's a lot of things I think we could unpack around that question around quotas and, and so forth is that we don't see it in, in many other, you know, public spaces or faces, even our public education, high schools, when we like, you know, who's superintendent, who's principal, you know, all of these things that it's a trickle down effect and it's all has impact right, on the economy on women's participation. Because if you can't see it, <laughs> right, it's hard to believe it. And I mean, I think the election of, with, with you know, Kamala Harris in the US was, it showed us that, you know, that people need to be able to see it, to see themselves right, in that moment. And when we talk about adding more women to boards and so forth, I just wanna make one more kind of uh, comment. It may be somewhat controversial and picky, but I think it's important to ask, well, which women? I mean, if it's just gonna be all white middle-class women that are advancing a particular vision, then that's not what, um, what moves us forward necessarily. And um, I think a lot of feminists uh, are seeing the limits of that argument when you look at just what happened in the US with the Supreme Court, um, with the appointment of Amy Coney Barrett, who is actively against any particular kind of gender equality um, initiative. So we can have quotas, but we also have to be mindful of you know, how that could play out um, as well. Um, thank you. Before we end off, I do have one final question, um, more so a comment from uh, your, with your expertise. So for those um, young women in the audience um, who are wanting to have some tips and advice on leadership positions and to find mentors, can you share your um, experiences or advice on how they can go about doing that? Um, and we can start off with Dr. Orser if you'd like. Okay, well, I would say ask. I would say, uh, in fact, I will encourage you to go to the Scotia Women Initiative website because I have a mentoring tool on managing your social capital. And it's a diagnostic to say, what do you need? What's the sunset? Develop a portfolio of mentors, not just one, and be very clear about your expectations and what you need. Then pick up the phone. I think you'd be perhaps pleasantly surprised when you're very clear about your needs and your ask, um, you may find that people are quite receptive to um, supporting a protege. And again, think about what you provide to that individual as a reciprocal benefit, be it your knowledge of the marketplace, your experience, your insights, your perspective. Um, Ms. Valji, if you wanna take that one on. I think just to echo as, our, as, as Barbara said, to, to, to ask, I think the portfolio of mentors is, is really wise. I would also say um, uh, perhaps find existing initiatives um, and networks uh, that allow you to, to meet and engage and, and, and build up that, uh, that portfolio of mentors uh, as well is important. Dr. Parisi? Yes, um, I would echo that. I would also echo that um, I think it's okay too to just ask somebody, even if it's just a one-time thing you want their expertise on, right? That it doesn't have to be an ongoing mentorship, but it could be just something, a very short, right? Um, kind of targeted uh, mentorship. I routinely work with um, girls from high schools and middle schools here who email me out of the blue and say, hey, I'm working on this project. And, um, and I think it's great, right? Because I, I don't get to interact with them for years and years and years, but we've made a connection we have something to talk about. Um, it's uh, it's important to you know to to reach out. And I've often advised my own students that if they're thinking about careers and they don't know where to go, right? That like, but they see people doing jobs, say for example, like Nala or Barbara. Um, hey, that 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 looks cool. How do I get there? How do I? What do I need to do to get there? Right? Just doing even an informational interview with somebody can really help because they can point you in the right direction, right, for you to achieve what you want to do, and maybe point you to some other people that could be uh, mentors. So it only takes one person to kind of, you know, move you or push you or give advice right, in the right direction. And, and Dr. I, Mc... not... Sorry, go oh, ahead, Dr. Orser. I just wanted to make uh, one note, um, research undertaken at Telfer mirrors other studies in that if you do have a mentor, you're more likely to enjoy career satisfaction and advancement. So I really do mean it, go for it, uh, because I think you know understanding the politic of organizations, navigating uh, referrals and introductions, these are all really important assets that you're acquiring 
through that mentoring relationship. Uh, Dr. McPhail, did you have anything you'd like to add to the last question here? I'm not sure that I have uh, anything to add. I think that the panelists have already really covered it well. I mean, I, I think that the networking is really important. Um, I think it's also important to be realistic about, um, you know, that relationship that you're um, you're establishing with somebody that people have pretty specific areas of, of interest and expertise. And so you do want to be a little bit careful about uh, who you're approaching and, and what you're asking. Thank you. And, and for somebody like myself, who is um, kind of growing in this area of expertise in itself, I have looked to my mentors to ask questions and ask for help. And for a fact, the women in my life, um, they've helped me so much in, in growing and in doing as um, all of you have said. So with that, I would like to thank you all very much for being on this panel. And I'd like to thank um, Dr. Mephil especially for asking the questions and for our speakers. Um, thank you for um, being here. Um, I really enjoyed hearing your insights, um, in, especially on investing in the care economy, um, in gender equality and uh, funding programs on gender. It's all really important. And I'm sure that our audience here um, has felt the same way. I also am very much looking to, very, and I'm looking forward to see um, how these type of policy recommendations tonight, um, we, the ones that we've discussed may lead down the road in our de deliberative democracy process. Um, I would also like to thank my team, Sabah Gauss and Tatiana Parish, who played a key role in the organization of tonight's successful event. Um, to let you all know, our next event is on December 2nd from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m., titled The Future of the Global Economy. And here we will discuss the future of AI and how, will it, how it will impact Canada's economy. Um, and as we continue our, to roll out our de deliver democracy exercise, your participation is more important than ever. We invite you to attend our future foreign policy by Canadian events, so the one on December 2nd. And any support which you can bring us will also bring the project closer to achieving its goals. I would like to thank you all for joining and welcome you to um, join our branch as a member. Um, thank you speakers and attendees for joining and we all hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you so much.